Well, I want to say hi to everybody who is watching right now. I'm John Orberg. I'm a pastor at Menlo Church. We're in such an extraordinary season with the coronavirus, with the uncertainty, with sheltering at home, and we're working hard as a church to want to remain connected with everybody. So uh, these next moments are going to be a terrific time. We get to talk and learn together from Dr. David Carrion, and he is uh, a part of our church. Uh, he is a psychiatrist and neuro researcher and a person of great faith, and um, he's got lots to tell us. We're going to learn a lot together over these moments about how do we make it through this season, but I thought, first of all, Dave, I would love for you to tell us some about your background, your interest in mental health, your interest in spirituality, so that people get a little sense of who you are. Sure thing. Uh, well, first off, thanks for having me on the, uh, uh, the show, uh, as it were. Um, yeah, so uh, I uh, grew up in California and have always been, um, for a very long time, wanted to be a doctor. Um, and uh, originally thought it was going to be uh, medical missions, but I think have been directed in the direction of um, psychiatry and neuroscience. Um, I've always loved the big ideas, like ever since I was you know, a teenager, I always loved having, you know, deep conversations on impossible questions deep into the night for hours and hours and hours. And that, that was, it's one of my favorite things and always has been. And, um, you know, it was only recently, uh, several years ago that I realized, hey, I could, I could turn this into a job uh, that, you know, the, the big questions are, you know, relevant to at least one particular part of, of medicine, mm -hmm. I, th I think more than one field, but, um, but definitely, um, the you know these existential issues these these questions of life and death and meaning and significance are um very much present in psychiatry so um i started shifting in that direction in medical school did some neuroscience research and loved it and uh have really um explored that space ever since uh, so i uh, trained in um, at stanford for uh medical school i guess i i skipped ucla went to ucla for undergrad um got an engineering degree back when i thought i was going to do uh, medical missions and then uh, focused on um, psychiatry and medical school, uh, got into residency at Stanford, uh, did that for four years, and am now um, part-time faculty at Stanford, but spend most of my time uh, in my private practice in uh, Sunnyvale. It's called uh, Acacia Mental Health. Um, we focus on the most severe cases of depression. And so questions that arise with depression um, are, are very um, significant to me. So... Let's dive in. And just to make you feel at home, I'm putting my David Carrion glasses on. <laughs> we got matching glasses. Yeah, yeah. If anybody is watching this and they want some David Carrion glasses, just contact the church. We'll send you a pair. Um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit, David, about this season is so unprecedented. None of us have ever experienced anything like this. We don't have a category for it. We don't have a memory for it. Um, so talk a little bit about what is it that we're experiencing? How can we even name the dynamics that make this as powerful as uh, this season is, and what are the responses uh, that you see in people as you meet with them that folks might identify with? Well, John, I think, I think you're so right. I mean, this is, I mean, needless to say, unprecedented. Um, I think it was, uh, it was pointed out this weekend, I mean, this is the first time ever that we haven't had Easter in person uh, face to face. I'm like, that's, you know, we've been a country for a long time and, uh, and how that's not just us, that's around the world, uh, services are being canceled and, um, there's uncertainty in the economy and, you know, historic shifts in, in employment and, uh, and financial security. So I, I think that the, the thing to at least identify first is that this is, um, that the, the strains placed on our nervous systems or our psyches are, are just, unprecedented. Um, and yeah, so I, I suppose there's a, and, and I don't suppose, I also have, uh, you know, talked to, uh, you know, uh, over a hundred people the last few weeks, just in the course of my work, um, uh, seeing patients. And yeah, the, the, the responses kind of range the spectrum. I think the, the part that I was expecting was the anxiety responses. Yeah. Um, now, you know, so anxiety is, is, a, is a typical God-given normal response to uncertainty. Um, that anxiety is, is God given. Yes, yes. That it's uh, that there are parts of of this whole thing that I deal with, you know, mental illness um, uh, and disorders that you know we might say from a theological perspective are a part of the fall. 
that mm -hmm. uh, it should not be there in a perfect world. It wouldn't be there. Um, but you know, God has given us a nervous system that responds to stress. Um, and, you know, in, in a very high level sense, um, the, uh, the fight or fight response, the um, sympathetic nervous system is there to help us respond effectively to threats. And so, you know, whether it's a physical threat or a social threat, um, it allows us to, in okay. you know, some very specific physiologic ways, like, you know, our, you know, our ability to focus or ability to, um, to, to run faster, to, uh, to be more alert. Um, all of these things are happening as these threats have come. And so it helps us physically respond better. Um, and it's the difficult thing is with, you know, situations like this is, you know, what is an uh, appropriate amount of, of stress or stress response? Um, how big is this threat? Um, and it's, it's, you know, experts disagree about the exact quantity or the number of expected deaths or the consequences of the economy. And some people um, some people's nervous systems are, you know, maxed out and other people are having a fine time. <laughs> so that adds to the stress because uh, there's not only the threat, there's the uncertainty of the threat. Right. Right. And well, then you were saying, you were saying you expected anxiety, but it sounds like there are other ways that people are responding that might have been more of a surprise. Yeah, no, I, I, I guess I, I um, didn't expect so many people to say, I'm doing okay. Hmm. And, and that's probably the most common response. And, and, you know, you think about like, well, you know, your, your life is completely thrown off. Uh, your living situation is completely thrown off. You're making dramatic changes in your relationship. You're making huge improvements or decreases in, you know, how your work is, is happening in the number of hours and where you're doing it and what you're doing, all of these things. And you're doing okay. Like that's, it's, it's, um, it's, and then some people are, are, you know, frankly, flourishing, um, that making these changes and uh, doing so with a, um, with a, uh, a spirit about them that is inspiring, uh, taking this as an opportunity to, um, to donate more, to sacrifice more, to, to serve their neighbors. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think it's, um, I, I think as much as uh, I, I, I guess I didn't expect that to be as uh, common mm. um, as it is. Mm. So, um, I'd love for anybody watching for us to dive in and talk about, uh, we don't know how much longer this era is going to go, but uh, while it's happening, how can people make it through and not just make it through, but how can we actually flourish? Uh, what, are the, what are the elements of our life that we ought to be thinking about and trying to manage really well? Yeah, I, I think that's a, I mean, this is the, the, such an important question. And I think that the, the, way to think about this in part is to think about it like any other any other challenge or any other any other um mental health uh concern so you know i think there's there's a lot of things that are specific but there's a lot of things that are general um there's a lot of times that we are put under pressure that we're put under stress i see a lot of patients that come because of a personal stressor because of a, a relationship or a job or um, something is thrown off in their life. Um, it just so happens that it's now, you know, billions of people that have something thrown off all at the same time, as opposed to um, an individual personal situation. So I, I think one of the things to think about is what, what leads to flourishing mental health in the midst of mental health challenges, just in general, um, and that some of those things will apply and some of those things won't. Um, so the, the, the broad categories, um, and something I, I, a rubric or a framework I like to think about is um, how can we flourish brain, body, and soul? Mm. Now, these are kind of arbitrary categories that, that, uh, that kind of overlap. And uh, I think from a, I, I've, I've racked my philosophical brain for some sort of comprehensive system that just explains everything without any remainder. And that, you know, the soul is over here, the spirit is there. And like, you know, we've got a very nice, clean, but I, I've given up that quest and I've just made sort of arbitrary lines. And uh, so in this sense, um, there are things that are good for your physical body um, yes. that are, that doesn't really matter if you've got deep insights or are thoughtful about it. Um, it just, it's just good for your physical body. Um, we all have bodies and that, how do we, how do we 
do well for our bodies. Um, but then we also have brains that are a little bit, maybe one level of this abstraction more. Um, and there's a complexity to brains. There's certain things that brains need that, um, that say a, a plant body might not need. And then there's, th there's a uh, level uh, yet higher of what we might call the soul, or if, um, if non-Christians are tuning into this, uh, I, you know, a mind or a psyche. Um, mm -hmm. These these sorts of higher aspects of the human experience, and trying to trying to do well to care for each one of these parts of ourself. Um, so why don't we start with the body? I was reading last weekend. Mick LaSalle is a movie reviewer for the San Francisco Chronicle, uh -huh. and he was talking about how this is just a good time to watch a lot of movies. And he said <laughs> you know, during this season, you can just uh, gain weight and drink more wine, or you can gain weight, drink more wine, and become an expert on old movies. Uh, so he's kind of fatalistic about it. But then I talked to somebody uh, actually earlier this morning who over the last couple of months, including this season, has lost 30 pounds. But it seems like most people are, there's something about this season. We want a cocoon. We want comfort. How do we think about and care for our bodies well? Yeah, and one of the, the so I'm going to be sharing a lot of uh, good ideas, and uh, it's one thing to remember through all of this is not letting um, the uh, not letting perfection rob progress. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're you know eating a pint of ice cream every night, if you go to half a pint of ice cream every night, that's progress, um, and, and you should really celebrate that. <laughs> um, so, um, but all that to say. Um, and, and having a lot of grace for yourself is an important aspect here too, that this is a, again, this is unprecedented. So if you, you know, if you end up gaining weight through this period, you know, that's, that's understandable. Now at the same time, uh, having that grace doesn't also mean that we can't um, strive to flourish more. And that's what some, that's sort of the category of these recommendations. So I think in terms of the, the diet, it's, it's, so what you eat is one of the most, um, one of the most powerful levers or um, keys to mm. changing how you feel. Mm. And on a micro level, we all know this. Um, if you eat terribly, you feel, you feel terrible immediately afterwards. You know, um, again, I guess going to that pint of ice cream, if you, eat, if you eat a bunch of like not good for you food or you know, a bag of potato chips or something, you, everybody knows that is not going to in like 30 minutes have been a good idea. It's a good idea when you're eating it, but it's going to be a bad idea immediately afterwards. Um, and you know, you're going to be lethargic. You're not going to feel good. Might have a stomach ache. And you know, so so it's these. Uh, so, but that also plays out on the larger scale too. Um, one of the uh, most effective ways to address depression, even like major depressive disorder, is to pr prescribe healthy eating groups. Hmm. So if you just have people go to healthy eating groups that is an effective antidepressant treatment. And we're not talking about like, oh, I'm a little down. I'm talking about like people with, you know, clinical depression, attain remission from clinical depression with a treatment that involves eating healthy. So it, it goes a long way and it's not a panacea for everybody. It might not be every person that gets better, but, um, but you can make huge changes in how you feel with how you eat. Mm. And I think that we're just getting started with, um, you know, what precisely are the components of diet that are helping you feel less anxious or um, more peaceful. Um, but, you know, you don't have to go too far down the road. We, we you know, the, 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 for most people, there's a few things we could all think of that we're eating too much of or that are not good for us and we know it. Um, and so the best tested diet is the Mediterranean diet. So it's, um, if you Google around for uh, instructions or um, you know, recommendations there. Um, it's a pretty well characterized diet. So heavy on vegetables, um, whole grains, minimal on red meats and sweets and uh, a decent amount of dairy. That, that's kind of the best recommended one. But again, I think it's mostly that you're not eating, you know, crap. If you just eat healthy, um, <laughs> what most people understand to be healthy, that's, that's not too bad. Yes, yeah, so you had kind of a memora memorable way of summarizing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't eat crap. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so, and that's, that's a big part of, um, uh, of bodily health and, and that, that, that feeds back into your, your mood, your state, your anxiety. Um, so just before we move on for everybody that's watching this, if you just take a moment, cause I remember when you first were talking about this and I thought, 
I don't know that I've been real intentional about that since we have been in this season. And so just to take a moment to say, I could do that. And the next time I go to the grocery store, I'm going to uh, buy those kinds of foods and have them here at home and just make the commitment that I'm going to do that. And that actually, it's funny, just even forming that intention gave me kind of a lighter spirit. Yeah. No, and, and I think that's, that's exactly right. The other, the other great thing about, um, uh, well, we've, uh, I've done some work in the past and uh, on willpower. Um, and I guess John, so have you, uh, you, you we did that together, uh, a project, uh, called uh, soul pulse, uh, some years back. And, uh, you know, one of the findings of, with, with these studies is that, you know, we'll, you don't have an unlimited supply and trying to think about where you apply that limited supply of willpower is key. And so if you could like just nail the one hour that you're at the grocery store, like that is a really key moment to just try to be on your game. And uh, yeah, let us, you know, can't be perfect every moment, um, but focusing on certain key moments in your week um, and, and that, could, that could really have a lot of leverage. So yeah, grocery store is a, a great place. Okay, what else? Um, the rest, uh, for the body, the other, um, the other suggestion uh, is um, light exposure. Now this one surprised me when I first found out about it. Again, like we're talking about like major depression and these like serious conditions and like, um, you know, people with depression often say, I I'm in a dark place. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. so uh, I have an idea. Let's shine like a really bright light right in your face. It's like, that's, that's not what they meant. That's not at all what they meant. Yes. It's a metaphorical darkness, but yet that is actually an effective treatment for, again, major depressive disorder. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some debate about whether or not um, it's only uh, major depression that gets worse in the winter or if it's all depression. But, um, but the, the, the fact that that would work is, is, is astonishing. Um, and so basically the experiment was literally just a, a box with a big bright light in it that you sat in front of for 30 minutes in the morning. And that is an effective treatment. Now, if you don't want to spend $100 on a box, um, at least in California, we have this really cheap source of photons um, that's like outside every window. Um, and we got lots of sun available, at least here. Um, and most places have enough sun that just going outside for, you know, an hour or two a day mm. can make a huge difference in mm. helping to regulate your, um, your, your sleep cycle um, and helping to communicate to your brain. This is the time to be awake. If you want to sleep at night, be awake right now. And I think one of the major drivers right now of why people are feeling so bad in their sleep hygiene is in, you know, going to sleep later, getting, you know, sleeping in later mm -hmm. is that we're not getting as much light exposure um, as we did before. Mm. So trying to, um, trying to, to, to get outside, um, you know, again, within the, the limits of uh, social distancing and uh, whatever your local authorities are um, suggesting, but, you know, in most places you could still go outside, go for a walk, even sit outside if that's uh, in places that that's allowed um, is a, is a great, a great idea. Yeah, it's funny in our neighborhood. Um, I have never, Nancy and I will often go for a walk, never seen so many people out walking. <laughs> and um, partly it's just good to get to see bodies again, just yeah. to be outside and get to see families, people walking their little kids, everybody's walking a dog. Um, but people just need to form the intention of getting outside, whether you're walking or not, and literally exposing themselves to sunlight for an hour or two a day. Right. Hmm. Right. And, and I, I think you're right. This is one of the silver linings of the, um, of the pandemic is, yeah, I mean, like there's neighborhoods again, <laughs> like there's, yes. there's a bunch of people hanging out, like mm -hmm. where they live and uh, being outdoors and like waving to each other. Um, you know, maybe not talking because you can't be that close, but uh, hey, at least they're waving. <laughs> yep. Yep. And then you were saying uh, light also helps with sleep. So talk a little bit about sleep because I'll talk with a lot of people and their sleep cycles seem to be real different now. How important is it? How do you pursue it well? Yeah, this is probably uh, one of the, the biggest um, modifiable factors for a lot of people. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can't control um, in mental health, like um, uh, what, what your childhood was or your genetics or things like that are, are out of your control. And you can respond, you can change how you respond to it and how you process it or, you know, in therapy or individually or with um, pastoral care, like how you deal with things like that. But, but this is a behavior that you can, for most people, can change. And the good news about that is that for a lot of people, um, 
it, it, it makes a huge difference in their, their mood and their uh, level of anxiety. Um, that there's no surer way to make a person feel anxious than sleep deprive them. Um, and just, you know, keep waking them up and then they're, they're not going to be, not going to be happy. They're not going to be calm and peaceful. Um, it's actually a form of like military, uh, uh, torture, punishment, yeah. uh, interrogation technique. Yeah. So, so another, uh, another tip from your, uh, friendly neighborhood psychiatrist is, uh, don't apply military torture techniques to yourself <laughs> for no reason. It's really good. <laughs> um, but you know, I say that tongue in cheek, but this is this is hard stuff. I mean, it's it's really hard to um, to do what you should um, mm -hmm. with with sleep. And and I think uh, unlike uh, you know exercise and things we'll get to, um, there are a few uh, counterintuitive ideas about sleep or or ideas that are for uh, optimum sleep hygiene. We call it sleep hygiene. I don't actually know why we call it sleep hygiene. Like you want to have your sleep clean, I guess. Uh, but <laughs> in any case, um, <laughs> sleep hygiene recommendations and. You know, one of them is, uh, and, and the key is like just doing everything you can to get your sleep at night um, and to fall asleep and just not toss and turn in bed. Now, and that's another thing um, that uh, people have asked me and uh, people have asked is, is, you know, I'm anxious or I've got lots of things on my mind. How do I, how do I fall asleep? And, and the answer is like, the counterintuitive answer is if you're not falling asleep, don't go to bed, get out of bed. <laughs> so wait until you're sleepy. Um, and okay. And this leads to the, the other sort of counterintuitive, um, why the strategy is so counterintuitive. Okay. So it's 10 o'clock and you can't sleep and you're anxious and you're, uh, you're trying to, uh, you're trying to fall asleep. And, okay. So you get out of bed and you, uh, sit and read something for an hour great. Now you're sleepy. You try to go to sleep again. doesn't happen. You get out of bed again. Uh, maybe read until midnight or one, and then you go to sleep and you got to get up at, you know, 6am and you went to bed at one and that's going to be a terrible day. So you've only gotten a few hours of sleep that night. Now what's going to happen the next night? Well, the next night, if you don't take naps, you're going to be very sleepy. The, the 10 o'clock bedtime is that's going to work tomorrow night. And if it doesn't tomorrow night, it's definitely going to start to to take by the third or fourth night. Like sleep is magical in that it, you, you can only go so long before you crash. And for most people, a strategy like that is gonna take care of most sleep problems. Mm. Um, so avoiding naps and only going to bed, going to sleep when you're sleepy. Um, and then that sort of strategy will help reset your, your clock. Um, the well, avoiding is, naps, because I'll often hear people say to be able to nap is a really good thing. Churchill used to say it enabled him to kind of give himself two days every day, but you know, you're, you're anti-nap. I, uh, I going off of the, uh, the, the recommendations are anti-nap. No, uh, I will, I will hedge my bets here and say that there's uh, important research to be done about how napping can be effective and uh, strategic. So, you know, a lot of places have naps as a way that, that are uh, built into uh, culture. So um, uh, I know that uh, this is a, this is common in, uh, many places, I think the uh, the sort of uh, trying to keep naps under an hour and trying to have them before three o'clock, if you have to have a nap, uh, would be the best idea. If your sleep is terrible at night and you want to make some improvements, naps are a great place to cut. Um, so anybody who's watching this, if you'd like to be part of a, like a nap volunteer research project, <laughs> just contact Dr. David Carrion and uh, we'll get something rolling for you. I have found, uh, I always... Uh, everybody loves talking about their sleep. I don't know why. I always fall asleep, almost always fall asleep really quickly. But I also almost always wake up during the night. And over the last couple of years, I've actually just uh, uh, cultivated the habit or sought to that if I wake up and I can't go to sleep in the next 10 minutes, I physically get out of bed, yes, go someplace else to read and then go back to sleep. But I found that um, it's one thing to say it uh, when I'm having this conversation with you, when I'm laying in bed and it's one or two in the morning, it's another thing to actually do it. And it did take some um, determination to follow through with that. Yeah, no, it, it's, these are, these are not, this, this, this category in particular is not necessarily intuitive or straightforward or easy. Um, but like I said, one of the, um, one of the most, uh, if you could really get good sleep every night, and again, there's, there's, you know, 
plenty of factors that are out of your control that make this nice clean strategy that I've described, um, you know, impossible. If you've got like, if you have an infant, like, sorry, uh, this is not an effective strategy. <laughs> um, it's just, right. you know, this is, so there's, um, you know, but, but to the extent to which it's in your control, yeah, doing this is, is hard, but usually very worthwhile. Um, and again, once you get yourself on a good cycle, it comes naturally. This is kind of uh, ways to reset it. Um, yeah. I and, remember uh, an old um, Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. He used to do this routine where he would, he would just kind of go off and, I'm night guy. Night guy likes to stay up all night. Uh, have to run on three hours of sleep. That's morning guy's problem. I'm not morning guy. I'm night guy. And then morning guy wakes up. Oh, I hate night guy. My only solution is to uh, oversleep so long that day guy can't go to work and make any money and night guy can't afford to go out sometime. But that, <laughs> uh, why do I do what I don't want to do? Why do I not do what I yeah. do want to do? Uh, that, that sense of I'm multiple selves at different times. Yeah. You know, my values are great. And then I'm learning uh, how weak my will is. Yeah, no, and, and, and I think this is, this is where habits can really be a rescue, um, that yeah. it takes a lot of applied exertion to get into a good um, routine, whether it's eating or sleeping or exercising or going outside or working or whatever it is. And, and I think this is, you know, I guess tangenting a little bit, I think this is why this has been such a hard, uh, so hard for a lot of people is all of our habits are different. Like, you know, the, the, the things that we've developed over years and years and years, I get up at this time, I, I get in the car at that time, I listen to this radio station, I get to work at this other time, I, you know, work until this time, I go to lunch, I hang out with the guys, I, you know, none of that's happening now. So like, you know, start over, like all your habits, like just start from scratch. It's like, geez, it takes some time to build habits. One of the, one of the books that I'm reading during this season uh, is a book called, I think it's Healthy Mind, Sick Soul, How William James Can Save Your Life. <laughs> and uh, the author is writing about the American philosopher psychologist, William James, uh, whose you know, uh, enormous book, The Principles of Psychology, was kind of the foundation of the field. Uh, and he writes that James basically was dealing with habit and the role of habit in life and uh, the notion of plasticity, neuroplasticity, yeah. which is one of the concepts that James wrote about so much, uh, and uh, dealing with habits. The, the author's comment was, uh, habits have been a central theme to Western self-help literature dating back to Aristotle. <laughs> and Aquinas, I remember Richard Foster talking about Aquinas in the Summa Theologica, this very you know, weighty theological book, devoted, I think, 70 pages to cultivating holy habits. And yeah. uh, that's what James is saying also, is that our willpower is so limited and that most of our life we just outsource to habits. And I hadn't thought about it till you mentioned it right now. But yes, 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 of course, part of what's happening in this time is, and it's probably why it creates so much discomfort for us, it's disrupting our habits. And we don't like that at a level where because they're habits, we don't even think about them. Yeah. Now and so you know so now I got to pick up the pieces and you know refigure out my sleep habits. Um, and now I've got to refigure out my you know apply willpower to getting up at this time when I don't have the you know the the threat of getting fired if I don't show up at a certain time hanging over me. Now I, I get up whatever whatever time I want. Nobody's gonna know. And it's like okay, well, great. Now I've got to develop some habit around getting up at a reasonable time. And you know my habit about just eating whatever's at the cafeteria is now broken. Now I got to figure out what to eat. <laughs> you know, maybe uh, start a, uh, what a sourdough starter is, uh, is uh, learning to bake bread or something. This is like, you know, we, we, got, we got lots of stuff to figure out. But, but I think what you're saying about um, uh, habit neuroplasticity is absolutely, um, absolutely key. And, and I think this sort of shifts to um, something else that is just critical in this time. And, mm -hmm. um, and I guess this is getting to the, to the brain and maybe even um, the, the, the soul level of, of abstraction or, or of understanding here. Um, and that is, you know, healthy thoughts. And mm. I think um, there's definitely the, the like motor habits, like brushing your teeth is a great habit. Um, but, you know, but again, these, these habits of thought or habits of behavior, you know, how do I treat my wife? How do I, uh, you know, talk to my coworkers? Um, you know, how do I think about the world? Um, and you know, how do I behave on social media? Do I behave on social media? 
Um, all of these things are shaping our brain and our soul um, in a particular way. And as we sort of repeatedly do things, we sort of uh, uh, crystallize um, these repeated actions into habits and, um, and they help us get what we say we want. So yes. if we can efficiently get clean teeth if we apply the habit of toothbrushing, we can efficiently get mad if we uh, apply the habit of you know reposting something on the internet that makes us mad. Um, like it just makes it faster and more efficient and more effective. Um, I love that distinction it. between uh, motor habits and habits of thought. I think a lot of times uh, for most of us, when we think about habits, we think about things like um, tying my shoes, <laughs> or uh, driving a car, or biting my fingernails, uh, when actually habits govern us at much deeper levels than that. And I was thinking, uh, our son Johnny is a surfer, and I will go out with him sometimes, although they're closing all the beaches down, so even that's being lost to us. Um, but uh, uh, being able to recognize a wave that will be a good rideable wave. It's not going to close out. It won't crash too quickly. It will have enough juice to get you up uh, is an art. And uh, I discovered pretty early on, Johnny and I could both be looking at the same wave coming in, but he would be able to recognize immediately that will be a good one to ride or nope, that will close out. It can hurt you way before I will. And that too is habit. It's just a function of he has watched so many waves coming in and then sought to relate uh, to them with his body and learned more and more how to recognize them by how much they thin out, how steeply they rise, what their color is. Uh, so even something like perception is a habit-based phenomenon. And what that means is when I look at another person what I see in them, do I see good? Do I see someone interesting? Or do I just see someone who is or isn't useful to me? Or someone who is or is not potentially an object of lust? All that really is the product of habit. But we don't often think of habit at that level. Right. No, I, I think you're, that's such a good um, picture. And I'm not sure if you were, if you were intentionally setting this up, but as the waves of anxiety come, mm. uh, this is a, you know. Yes, of course. That's exactly where I was going. <laughs> that's how we, uh, but, but yeah, but that's how we, um, we, we ride them. And, and whether it's uh. a, um, you know, physical activity, like, you know, and again with, you know, anxiety waves, um, similar. So, okay. So just for, for clarity about this metaphor, just so no viewer has any misconception, I have never successfully stood up on a surfboard in my life. So <laughs> I am, I know exactly how this works, John. Um, so as you're surfing, yes. you just see that wave and you know, it's going to be a good one. Um, but, um, but yeah, sometimes the, the shrewd thing to do with a wave of anxiety um, is to, um, is to write it, mm. to write it out um, and to, to let it, let it wash over you. So, um, so say a little bit more about that. If somebody is feeling anxious now, what does it look like to ride a wave of anxiety? So um, this, this comes from um, the, the background, uh, the, the, these suggestions come from like what to do with like extreme versions of anxiety. So with extreme versions, I'm talking about like panic attacks, panic mm -hmm. attacks. Um, uh, it's, it's a, a word that's becoming more common. I think that, um, it's, it's fair enough to use it in vernacular. Oh, I'm having a panic attack. It's like, I'm anxious. It's like, okay, that's fair. But people with a true panic disorder feel like they're dying. It's like all of the I'm dying chemicals in your body are released all at once. And you literally are afraid I, I must be having some sort of heart attack or I might be dying. Uh, this is clearly what death or, you know, about to die feels like. And so it's this extreme phys uh, physical response. And so once it gets past, like, if it's not that bad, often you can use calming techniques. So, um, so breathing exercises, prayer, going for a calm walk, having a conversation with a friend or a loved one, um, those are great techniques. Um, but what I mean by riding the wave is once it gets past a certain level, it ain't going anywhere. You're not going to, like, deep breathe your way out of a um, severe panic attack in most cases. And just recognize that as it's as it's happening um that you are separate from it 
that you are not the anxiety. The anxiety is happening to you and your body and you're, you can be an observer, um, but separating yourself from the anxiety is key. And then recognizing that, look, this is temporary. As much as I think that this is going to kill me, I, I'm going to recognize that all emotions are temporary. Um, and in, in our sort of culture, our, our world's case, um, yeah, we've got, we've got a lot of uncertainty for the next certainly months, maybe years. Mm -hmm. um, and that too, I mean, this too shall pass. Um, the proverb is applies to the nervous system too, mm -hmm. that um, your body ah. can only maintain mm -hmm. a extreme response like that for minutes, maybe a few hours. Um, and that's in the extreme case. In the less extreme case, uh, you know, you could tool along with low level anxiety for years. Um, but <laughs> Um, but how you respond to that differs. Um, and, and, but this, this is the strategy. This is sort of the, the, um, the art of living, the art of responding, the art of surfing um, these, these anxious waves. And uh, for somebody who is in a relationship with God, I don't have to just surface, surf it alone. I can surf it together with him and right. ask him to be a part of that with me. Right. No, th that's, that's absolutely right. And I think that um, there are you know, plenty of cases that, um, I've seen, I think it's, uh, almost stereotypical in some conditions. Um, but some cases where people will, um, talk about having a, you know, they, I, they turned my mental health condition over to God and was miraculously healed. And that mm -hmm. sometimes happens. Now, uh, most of the people I talk to, because I talk to them, um, that hasn't happened for, and I think a lot of grace needs to be given for, for people that it's not so easy. Um, but, at, you know, but for, for those who are Christian, um, you certainly have a, uh, a, a friend in Jesus and that's um, somebody to, even if he doesn't remove it, somebody to walk with you through it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've heard you say uh, pretty remarkable things about uh, exercise and how that can relate to things like anxiety and flourishing in mental health. And that's probably the one area when it comes to the body where folks may be wrestling right now in this season. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a, another really important uh, category. And especially it's another thing that's, that's fallen off. Again, with our sort of habits being disrupted, gyms are closed. And so if you like to go to the gym, well, now you can't. You like to go to the pool, you can't do that either. So now you got to figure out what to do. And, um, and so, you know, even the, you know, I used to walk from my parking lot to my office. It's like, well, you don't have to do that anymore either. So it's like, well, geez, like the amount of exercise that a person has to get is like pretty much close to zero right now um, to, to make it through a shelter in place. So it, it makes it a, a very important possible area of change or improvement. Now, um, the benefits of exercise, it, this is again, one of these categories that it's, it's, uh, I've, I've uh, seen other, other people, and I think I agree, if, uh, if exercise were a drug, it would be the biggest blockbuster drug of all times. Um, no kidding. Yeah, uh, that like the uh, benefits on uh, your uh, thinking, like there isn't a pill that you could take that improves your cognition. Um, we, we like to think there's a smart pill, but there's no smart pill. Exercise is a smart pill. It makes you smarter. Um, it improves your ability to, um, you know, and this is young people, old people, in between people, like it, it, it helps with cognition. It helps with mood. It prevents development of uh, mental health um, symptoms. If you already have mental health symptoms, it prevents them from getting worse. If you have a severe case of major depression, um, or if you have a, at least a, a, if you have a, if you have major depression, um, Exercise, uh, being assigned to exercise classes is yet another effective antidepressant treatment um, mm. with effect sizes, at least in some studies, larger than antidepressant medications. So we're like, it, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a wonder drug. It's a blockbuster. I mean, it, this, this is as good as it's going to get for um, things that you could do that would help you feel better. Now, again, the challenge, it's a catch-22. It's like, well, of course, um, the, the, the people who need it most have the least motivation to do it. Right. Um, so, you know, again, this is definitely an area to give, give yourself grace, um, but also recognize the difference between zero and a little bit is enormous. Mm. So um, that uh, in a lot of these studies, people who just have had their, as their only exercise was, was walking, like much better mental health than the people whose exercise was sedentary. And so, and again, in 
I talk, I, I deal with people. I, I have, uh, I treat people who are in extreme states of major depression. And even there, most of the time, a short walk around the block is still possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so even if you're feeling down, that's, that's especially a good time too. like, I, I'm, I'm literally talking about walk outside your door, walk down the driveway, walk back up. That's if that's all you can do in a day, spectacular. Um, but trying to incorporate some amount of exercise at least. Um, and if you're doing, and, and at least in terms of longevity, if you're doing a, if you're the middle of the road and you can move up a little bit, um, that's also going to help your, your long-term health. Um, and so mental health, physical health, uh, exercises, uh, got, uh, got few, few downsides and a lot of, a lot of upside. And this one especially seems like one where, uh, accountability can be helpful. Uh, there's a, uh, philosopher at uh, Baylor, Steve Evans, and uh, he and a team there are doing a whole lot of work on accountability. And they have a Templeton grant, and they're hoping to do for accountability what has been done for forgiveness and gratitude over the last mm -hmm. decade or two in positive psychology. And Steve feels like it, it needs to be turned from uh, making sure that people get punished if they do something wrong to be understood as a virtue. I have been given my life as a gift I'm accountable to it, uh, to God. That's actually uh, a, a measure of great dignity. And so to um, cultivate accountability to other people in my life can be a way of helping my life flourish uh, in which it might not otherwise. So just around exercise, to have at least one other person where I say, I'm gonna spend 30 minutes or 60 minutes a day doing this, and then checking back in with that other person at the end of the day or once a week. It's amazing for me when I have somebody like my friend Rick, where I know that he's going to ask me about commitments that I've made. I'm just way more likely to honor them, partly because I don't want to have to say to Rick, no, I didn't do it. Right, right. And, it's, and, and the, the amazing thing there is like, you know, this is a, this is a trusted friend and it's like there's no punishment per se. Like, you know, one would think that, well, you know, people do things because they have to, or people do things because it's like, no, he's just like the, the he's just doing what you, what you just asked him to do, which is ask you this question in the future, um, mm -hmm. which is, which is kind of astonishing um, about how effective it is. Yeah. And it's, um, so th there's also studies with um, uh, doctors and uh, quit dates. Um, basically, mm -hmm. you ask a smoker, uh, I want you to set a date on the calendar that you're going to quit on and tell me about it. And then I'll check in with you and you know, three months and like three months later, like simply that like several second interaction increases in a statistically significant way, mm. the, uh, the quit rates of people who are smoking. So just like announcing, like verbalizing, um, what I'm going to do to another human being. And putting a date, attaching a date to it. Yeah. Attaching a date to it, um, is another, you know, concrete way to, to make it real. And, you know, maybe the date's tomorrow, maybe it's, you want to, you know, uh, uh try to get up the gumption of the next week or two or whatever it is. But, um, but yeah, making, um, you know, it makes me, uh, makes me think of, uh, one of my favorite, one of my favorite essays by one of the most eclectic people in the world, uh, GK Chesterton, um, in defense of rash vows. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, he talks about just how beneficial it is to just, uh, make an appointment with myself at a future date. Like it'd be that, that when you sort of, uh, make an oath or say you're going to do something, it, it, creates this continuity in you and in the universe that is, um, is pretty amazing. You know, hu humans are pretty unique in their ability to uh, make, you know, make oaths or commitments or promises. Um, and so, you know, also being true to oneself and uh, being honest with oneself, I'm going to do X. Well, I, I well, I should tell myself the truth. Um, and yeah, that practice of making and fulfilling vows uh, is not something that is tends to be widely observed in our day because we value freedom so much. But there have been previous eras. If you look in the Bible, often that notion of vows or even fulfilling vows to the Lord, Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, has historically been part of flourishing lives. Yeah, and I mean, I think this is a great um, uh, a great example that um, if you bind yourself in this way to exercise whatever amount mm -hmm. it will provide greater freedom for you yeah. in the rest of your life um and so the point of of vows is is sort of it's almost like um 
with creativity, with, a, with any sort of creative endeavor, you have to set a frame. Uh, and like with, you know, painting, it's like a, a literal frame. You, you, you have to say, I'm good. I'm, you have to start in a canvas of a particular size. And that constrains your creativity. You can't go bigger anymore. Um, and so, so too with, uh, with these sorts of commitments. Yeah, Val, um, looks like it is actually the sacrifice of a small amount of freedom, but for the purpose of much greater freedom. Right. Um, to be able to run, to be able to be healthy, to be able to play the piano. Uh, it's for the sake of much greater freedom in the future. Right. Yeah. Well, that kind of leads to uh, another topic, David, and this will be the uh, last one, at least for this conversation. Uh, you talked about the fact that we're physical and we need to think about sleep and light and diet and exercise. Uh, but you also talk about resilience mm -hmm. uh, in this season of life. And then it's actually an opportunity to experience and even exercise becoming a more resilient person. Yeah. No. So this is something that I, I, I think is one of the most important and often overlooked aspects of the human psyche. Um, so we've heard a lot about, and I think, uh, importantly, um, over the past several decades, um, the reality of, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder that mm -hmm. after some terrible thing occurs, there are psychological reactions, um, that are a consequence of that initial, um, trauma or terrible experience. Things like flashbacks, nightmares, avoiding things that remind you of the original experience, um, uh, being, you know, easily startled, things like that. And, um, but I think the thing that doesn't get as much um, attention is what are other responses to difficult circumstances? Um, and I think that the, the at least clearest historical example of this um, is in uh, that I could of, of recent uh, that happened and was studied was the, the Blitz in uh, London in 1940. So, um, the Nazis were, and the British were very, uh, were, were expecting that if a certain number of bombs were dropped on an unsuspecting civilian population, they'd crack. That everybody knows that terror of death is one of the strongest fears. And if you threaten, you know, citizens of a town um, with this every night, it could be tonight, it could be tomorrow night, nobody knows. Is my house gonna be there when I wake up? Nobody knows. Just create this incredible amount of uncertainty. Um, yes, they'll blow up some buildings, but more importantly, they'll psychologically cripple the capital of the city that they're fighting. And so they did. So they dropped um, ton after ton of bombs on London. And both sides more or less expected the psychiatric hospitalizations, the, the psychiatric um, casualties to be in the millions. And the bombs started falling and these casualties never showed up. There were a few cases here and there. Um, the casualties were expected in the millions and counted in the dozens. Hmm. And what had happened, what happened was that this ended up drawing the uh, Londoners together and they had this, this, this common narrative and this common direction. Mm. I need to get back to work because that's, that's, my, that's my duty. That's my job. That will give me meaning and significance in the midst of, yes, fear of death. Um, and, you know, and even though tens of thousands of people, I think 40,000 people died um, over the course of those nine months um, at random at night in their sleep, they were still able to... Uh, press on and, um, and do, their, do their duty. And I, th I think that that's possible for humans. That just, it, it doesn't always happen. And oftentimes there are traumas and psychological circumstances where it doesn't happen and the trauma is just bad and the, um, the, the spirit of the people is broken. Um, and that's the end of the story, or at least that's the end of the, the, the earthly part. Um, but I think that, that that's what I'm, I'm hopeful for with this present crisis. Um, and I think I've seen a lot of examples of it too, of um, a lot of my patients being concerned and sacrificial um, for people around them, um, being able to uh, try to make a difference in ways that they hadn't expected. And, and I think in that way, in coming up with a, a narrative and coming up with and, and identifying, becoming a part of a story that's bigger than just the suffering, the mm -hmm. suffering is there and should not be denied, but 
what do we do in response to the suffering is going to make all the difference in how we as a world respond to this unprecedented crisis. I think you said that a uh, little sign, keep calm and carry on. <laughs> yeah. Back to- yeah, no, that's, uh, that, that, uh, that, that sign that became a meme. Um, apparently they printed uh, 2.4 million copies of this poster um, and then ended up not using it. <laughs> and, uh, and so they, uh, they discovered this like a, a few decades ago. And, and it was, you know, this, this uh, symbol of, you know, um, the, the, this British resilience. Um, and, you know, it's, um, and I think is, a, is an appropriate symbol of what's possible. Uh, what's possible for humans, and I think what's possible for humans that can um, can participate in things um, bigger than themselves, and I think that as Christians, um, you know, this is this is part part of the deal. You know, we're we're promised suffering, and in this case, it's coming from a virus. Um, but how can we um, how can we be like Christ in who who himself chose a path of suffering? Um, how can we learn from him? How can we be a part of, um, of that redemption of the world that involves great suffering of ourself and, um, and people around us? Um, that's, that's, that's one thing that can help give, um, give this meaning. I was going to say, so is that, uh, was that the primary difference maker, do you think, when the Blitz was going on in London, that uh, even though it was horrific, uh, people attached it to a, a transcendent cause greater than themselves that had meaning and it was their sense of meaning and purpose in it that allowed them to keep carrying on? Yeah, no, I, I think so. And I think that there's um, a lot of uh, complexity about um, what sorts of stories and a lot of questions though that are, are still unanswered about what kinds of stories or what kinds of, of things are going to lead to that um, that resilience. But yeah, um, a story that is bigger than simply, I am suffering a lot and there is no relief in sight. Um, Mm. That's a story that's not going to end well, um, if that's the end of the story, or if that's the end of the experience. Um, But if it's, uh, I'm going to do this sacrificially for my, my countrymen. And I think for, you know, for Britain, it was um, the transcendent thing was some kind of patriotism. Um, and I think in the present situation, um, you know, patriotism may be helpful, but I think it's, it's, this is happening to the whole world. Um, yeah. And so, you know, what sort of a story can we tell that involves, involves all of us? Um, I saw a meme the other day that said, uh, so we can save the world by staying home and watching TV on the couch. Let's not screw this up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's uh, that's the. That may that's, set that's... the bar a little bit low, but <laughs> to understand through this, uh, as we have um, physical uncertainty, health uncertainty, economic uncertainty, and then you know just uh, from the church, so many stories about people saying, "Who can I help? Who can I support?" Uh, people picking up takeout food and then wanting to. Uh, be generous so that the staff at that restaurant might get paid and it could stay open. Uh, people wanting to make sure that somebody who is elderly has groceries. Uh, uh, it's amazing. Once my thought is, how could I help somebody worse off? Yeah. Uh, how much better I feel about my life than when I just sit and look at my life. Yeah. No, I think that's, I think that's exactly right. I think that's exactly right. Well, David, thank you. This has been wonderful. Uh, everybody watching, get a free hour of therapy from Dr. David Carrion. <laughs> so um, thanks, and I hope we get to do it again. All right. Thanks, John.